is a, a session on the future of nuclear energy, economic, technical, and environmental drivers and constraints. Um, and I am Robert Bothwell. I'm uh, director of the International Relations Program uh, at Trinity College in the University of Toronto. Um, and uh, I'm also here because I was once an historian of the nuclear industry in Canada, uh, both um, uranium and reactors. Um, however, I'm conscious of the fact that I'm, uh, I think, the only historian actually appearing up here, so um, I have a, a unique role and also, I guess, a high standard to uh, uphold. Fortunately, uh, we have an excellent panel this morning, and they're going to be talking in order on economics, the technical aspects, and then on environmental considerations. These are all subjects that have been around the nuclear industry uh, ever since it was uh, founded in the Big Bang of 1945. Um, and uh, as an historian, of course, I'm tempted to say that there's nothing new under the sun, but I'm sure our panelists will disprove that, uh, that old historical observation. If they don't, I'll say something about it later. So uh, first to speak will be Dr. Karo Kekiyama, Senior Professional, Government Programs, IBM Japan. Uh, she has had a very long career dealing with nuclear issues. Uh, in particular, uh, she was Senior Director, International Programs in the Japan Atomic Industrial Forum and uh, is particularly uh, expert uh, in the field of nonproliferation, global climate change, etc. Second, we will have Dr. Edwin Lyman, Senior Staff Scientist, the Union of Concerned Scientists, in their uh, Global Security Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists in Washington, D.C., where he's been since 2003. Uh, he worked for the Nuclear Control Institute, Institute before that for eight years and took a doctorate in physics from Cornell. Uh, and Elizabeth Dowdswell, my fellow Torontonian, uh, and she is former president and CEO, Nuclear Waste Management Organization, uh, and former executive director, UNEP, the UN environmental program. Uh, and before joining the United Nations was Assistant Deputy Minister of Environment Canada from 1989 to 1992. Uh, so she obviously has a very long uh, experience in the, in the field of environment in which the nuclear industry is such a, a prominent feature. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Kifiyama who will start us off. Well, thank you very much. Uh, can you see my face? I'm, I was a little concerned there's a height here. Each time when I make a presentation in Western countries, always I'm concerned about my height because people may not be able to see me. But anyway, I hope people can see my face. At least you can hear my voice. So anyway, thank you, CZ, to invite me to this very stimulating and important conference on energy. Actually, last time I was in uh, Canada it was two years ago, attending uh, UNFCCC COP11. Um, conference um, at, the, at the Montreal, in Montreal. I was representing Japanese nuclear industry as an observer over there. And then I just uh, looking back just two years ago, and I, I, I realized that at that time, amongst our nuclear colleagues worldwide, we never realized, we never thought that a nuclear energy can be evaluated as it is now in the world. So uh, over the just past few years, um, I think, and uh, the, the energy market and the situation surrounding uh, energy supply has been dramatically changing uh, in terms of cost and price, and also the, you know, by, by far importantly, the climate change concerns are prevailing and to decide people's mind and what would be the viable energy option for the future. So uh, with that, uh, let me start my presentation. How can I do this one? Can I just press here? Surely. Um. <clears throat> I 
excuse me, working for IBM is a little and confused and <laughs> embarrassing with this modern technology. Okay. <laughs> Well, uh, this is a statement I just wanted to bring up in front of you. Uh, it's a, uh, this is a statement made by the National Petroleum Council uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, whose task is to advise the U.S. Secretary, uh, DOE Secretary, uh, Mr. Badman, on uh, future, uh, future uh, gas and oil price and uh, energy supply. And then, and within their own study recently released, uh, it mentioned that the maintaining a viable nuclear energy option will increase policy choices in future carbon constraint circumstances. I find it very unique and very striking uh, for someone who's been working in the nuclear industry because we never saw this kind of statement in the past year. So just I wanted to uh, and bring this up to you and just you know keep it in, in mind and while I'm just going walking you through to the, the, my presentation on economics. When I look at the actually the, uh, stable future energy supply, there are several challenges we have to face. These are six places I just wanted to mention to you. The first of all, of course, the carbon high. <coughs> Hydrocarbon resources will become more difficult to access and, and challengeable to produce, and we, and we are aware of that here. And the technology requirements will be increasingly complex and a demanding issue. And it is more so as we try to re require more energy efficiency through our advanced technologies. Cost of developing and delivering energy will escalate. Yes, naturally, yes. And demands on current and anticipated infrastructure are growing. Yes, typically countries like uh, India and China try to get access more and more to energy uh, sources, and uh, they need more infrastructure associated. The human resources may be inadequate to meet projected growth requirements. This is typical, especially for nuclear industry. Environmental constraints are getting bigger, yes, and indeterminate. Yes, these are the, the constraints and the challenges we have to keep in mind that when we look at what kind of future energy supply we are going to have and what kind of uh, strategy we should have. Before I'm going to the economics, just in a quick overview for you that where we are now and what we have ahead in our, in our energy market. This is very familiar slide, I'm sure for everyone, and uh, you, you know that's an our world uh, population will grow up to 10 billion by 2050, and half of the population will come from Japan, um, excuse me, from Asia. And then this is very important because uh, those you know, Asian countries are the biggest uh, energy a, a demander and consumer in, in the future, which we anticipate. This is a project uh, slightly uh, outdated in 2004, but I just wanted uh, you know, just to uh, have a quick uh, view that uh, you know, the, the largest energy consumption is, uh, is, is done in the United States. That's you know, what we know that. The reason why I wanted to bring this up because I didn't realize that Canada has got the largest energy consumption per capita. So if we were going to um, change this uh, energy consumption pattern, and we need a suddenly advanced technology for energy efficiency, and then that would also reduce CO2 emission. So that's something we have to think about, of course. This is the primary energy consumption for major countries. And then actually, the, the larger energy consumer has got, of course, a larger portion of a, a conventional traditional energy source, such as coal and, uh, and, and oil. And the United States uh, has the electricity produced by, excuse me, the United States primary energy supplies from oil is about 40%. Meantime, in China, nearly 70% is coming from coal. And this is very interesting because uh, uh, China is, uh, has got 10 nuclear power reactors right now, and they are projecting up to 40 gigawatt by year 2030. But still, the, the nuclear portion amongst uh, their own uh, energy uh, supply is very marginal. And the same thing will be happen, happening in India. The, in India, there are 15 reactors being operated in nuclear. And they are also uh, planning to have a, a most like a 40 gigawatt by year 2030. So these are the major, major nuclear uh, developers in Asia. However, again, you know, since their energy consumption is so large, the, uh, the nuclear share amongst total energy consu consumption is very marginal. 
this is just uh, you know, uh, the slide I wanted to show that, you know, how much reserves do we have. <laughs> and then this was projected at the end of 2005, so slightly again outdated, but it just you know, give you the, in a brief idea on how far, how, how much we can keep our reserves. And oil, we have about 41 years, but you know, people say we, sh we should have much, much larger amount. But uh, the, the uranium, for example, we have 85 years reserve, but uh, if we recycle uranium, means if we use plutonium after recycled, then uh, the, the reserve life will extend up to 2,570 years. So this is going to be very, very large a contribution in terms of uh, maximizing the uranium, uranium value. In fact, in, 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 for example, the United States, they have got uh, excess weapons plutonium, 34, 34 tons of plutonium, which are going to be used as mox fuel for civilian use. That would uh, give about uh, 100, excuse me, that would give about million households electricity supply for 50 years. So that would tell them how large you know, those plutonium recycled fill uh, and, and they can contribute to the energy security for not only for, for, for US but for the entire world. So this is the nuclear generating capacity up to year 2030. Currently there are uh, 442 nuclear power plants operated in the world. So uh, this projection has been created by World Nuclear Association and um, high, high projection tells by year 2030 we have about 700,000 megawatt means about 700 reactors in the world. And then the next question is then do we have enough uranium for that? Actually, yes, we do have u enough uranium. In fact, you know, uh, because of the nu nuclear renaissance and because of the high price of oil and gas and because of the climate change concern, uh, the uranium price went up in you know, over the past year or two. It's amazingly, now uranium price is about 100, the highest time it came up to $138 US dollars per pound. Now it came down a little bit lower, it's about $100 per pound. And then uh, the reason why it came down slightly because the, the major cause for the high uranium price was by the hedge fund and uh, in, intervene into the market and also there is a you know the major concern and uh, for example last year that the uranium supply would be enough up to year 2013. The, this year the World Nuclear Association give us the the number perhaps uh, our uranium reserve enough up to 2030 at least and uh, and also the small you know we call it the junior mining companies are also putting the money as investment on a new mine fields that would also give us a better prospect and you know, how for how much we can we can uh, keep our uranium uh, uh, supply to meet the demand so you know that uh, in terms of uranium supply we are not much worried about up to 2030 and then what in case of price even though we say $100 per pound, it seems very high, but the price, if it goes down below $50 per pound, normally we say perhaps it would discourage investment. So in the uranium mining, it, it takes a long, long time to get to the real production period. So you know, it is real commitment for the uranium miners also to put the money for the future future uh, supply so you know we have to keep a stable price at least above fifty dollars if we want to encourage the uranium miners to keep us to, to keep the investment what about the enrichment yes enrichment capacity yes it, we are going to have enough enrichment capacity year 2030 and the reason why because we are opening up new centrifuge uh, enrichment uh, uh, plant in the in United States also in France so we are going to have enough enrichment cap capability but so the price has been also going up there it used to be for example uh, the, the, the 10 years ago about um, uh, excuse me uh, the price was um, um, yes about ninety dollars uh, per uh, SW SW U means separate work of uranium now it's a price price is about between 130 and 135 uh, separate work of uranium so it came up pretty high over the past 10 years and then 
the trend is going to continue. So enrichment price, we expect, is going to be even more expensive. So I just want to um, tell you that the Japan's case. The Japan's nuclear uh, sector has got a little different policy than, uh, than other non-nuclear weapon states. Japan is the only one country which is allowed to reprocess our spent fuel. That means um, we can utilize our uh, reprocessing capability and then, and then uh, reprocess the plutonium and then use it to maximize our uh, uranium uh, value. The reason why we have reprocessing uh, policy because it goes back to the 1970s when the oil crisis hit the country. As you can see here, the Japan is, has got the lowest self-sufficiency rate for the natural resource amongst OECD countries. Meantime, you can see the Canada is about 139% of self-sufficiency. You know, you've got enough uranium, enough resource to export. And this is an optimal combination of power sources for typical Japanese utility companies. I just want to show this one to you because the nuclear power always and it gives us a large base load electric supply. Meantime, hydroelectric and also uh, oil uh, powered uh, plant will give the sort of adjustment capability to peak load uh, supply. The, here is the cost of the nuclear. Uh, generating electricity. Actually, as you can see this, the nuclear has got the lowest uh, generating cost amongst all energy supply. And then this is a, uh, this is a calculation made on a, and the assumption that um, uh, this is about 1,300 megawatt reactors at the capacity rate of 80% and operational period of 40 years. So we can uh, provide electricity uh, using nuclear, but 5.3 yen, and as I said, since Japan has a reprocessing policy, then we can have front and back end all cost involved. And the front end means this is a fuel procurement. It's about 0.66 yen per kilowatt hour. And for back end side, we have got a reprocessing plant, which is going to be just operated uh, next February, and it's, it was pretty expensive, actually, a project, and the, the completing and reprocessing plant costed us about 2.2 um, uh, billion U.S. dollars, so it's pretty expensive. However, when it breaks down into this in a per kilowatt hour, it can be accommodated in a, in a low price. So including all the commissioning of reprocessing facilities and waste disposal, transportation, all together, it comes up, up to 0.81 yen per kilowatt hour. So all together for the new nuclear fuel cycle expenses, it's about 1.47 kilo, uh, yen per kilowatt hour. The rest of the cost um, within 5.3 yen are all maintenance and operational cost. Oh, before I go to this, also the construction cost, uh, in case of Japanese plants, is a little expensive, but so about uh, between 2,900 US dollars and 3,000 US dollars per kilowatt. That is a construction cost. And this is uh, uh, just to, you know, I wanted to give you the idea that um, and, uh, what is the energy profit ratio? Energy profit ratio is. Um, calculated by energy output divided by energy input. And the energy output uh, is um, gener generation capacity times generation, uh, excuse me, capacity rate. And the energy input means all life cycle energy uh, induced into this, uh, the nuclear power plant. And the nuclear has got the highest energy profit ratio, as you can see here. And then, this is a life cycle assessment of CO2 emission. As everyone knows here, the nuclear does not uh, emit CO2 uh, during the operation. Meantime, it has got um, a slight CO2 emission level uh, during the operation, uh, excuse me, during construction and mining process. However, when it puts a price on a carbon, that can tell that the nuclear can be very competitive you know, as it is. As I said, in, in Japan, we have got a nuclear processing uh, policy, but we currently have uh, 55 nuclear reactors operating. The total output is 49,580 megawatts. And then 
the capacity factor of nuclear power in Japan. As you can see, this is a blue dot. In Japan, the capacity rate is not really high. It's uh, there because two reasons. One is we have got uh, very strict safety regulation. Therefore, uh, the, the periodic inspection comes every 13 months of operation. Meantime, other countries like the United States in 24 months or uh, France uh, 18 months then in, uh, 18 months operation uh, and then periodic inspection comes. And also during the period, periodic inspection, we normally spend about 100 days. So that means our capacity rate naturally goes down. At the same time, it will cause lots of economic burden on utility companies. And also another reason why our capacity rate is uh, low now is because we have several scandals going on. And also the recent earthquake hit the largest nuclear power station in Japan. That would also affect you know, the sort of unplanned shutdown. Therefore, our capacity rate this year will go down to maybe about 60%. Compared with the United States, nearly 90% is a very big difference. Then electricity generation costs, as I explained to you earlier, I just want to show you this. The nuclear has got the lowest fail cost. It's about 10% of total generation cost. So that means it does not get affected by volatile price change, just not like an oil and coal-fired plant. And also nuclear tends to have a long-term contract for uranium procurement. Normally it, it would go for like a 10 years contract. 10 years in advance contract, so we can often avoid the, the, the price fluctuation. So you know, the, that would give the nuclear as a pretty stable energy source also. Energy security with fuel cycle, uh, I just told you earlier. Anyway, uh, we have got the first reactor uh, to be operated in between 2040, 2050. That would give the, the nuclear uh, uh, our uh, uranium, re uranium resource more valuable and maximize the value uh, using the plutonium. The, by nuclear, in Japan, we avoid about 232 million tons of CO2. And uh, this is a quite a large amount. And of course, if you can put the price on a carbon, then that would give the nuclear a very competitive source, as you can see here. Actually, and as just a reference, in the worldwide, and the nuclear avoids about 2 billion carbons. carbons. So you know, that would tell how much nuclear has been contributing to the climate change mitigation strategy. This is just a quick reference as renewable energy in Japan. We have got about 1% proportion of new, uh, renewables amongst total electricity generation. I just wanted to show the, the price difference in, in terms of photovoltaic power. That generation cost would uh, come up nearly nine times as much as nuclear, or in case of wind, about double or three times of nuclear. Meantime, this uh, capacity rate is pretty low, as you can see. So we do not deny the significance of renewables, but we do not rely on them too much because of this, you know, the, the instability, instability of the energy supply from renewables. So after all this, I just wanted to share with you that what is the you know, nuclear energy, what kind of... Uh, uh, benefits we have, you know, economic competitiveness. Yes, you know, we saw that already. It's more stable and cheaper than fossil fuel, and also uh, uh, because of the, you know, the high oil and gas price. So, uh, you know, in, in the near future, in the long term, we still see the nuclear can be the very competitive. And also, if we have the, the, the economy, carbon economy, then uh, the nuclear can be even more competitive. And then also, the, you know, we can mitigate climate change by using a nuclear. And what about energy security? Yes, the nuclear can provide a large scale uh, based on the energy supply and also very stable uh, fuel procurement policy normally. So we can expect energy security for out of nuclear, especially new, uh, uranium is uh, re uranium reserves are found in very stable countries like uh, Canada and Australia, Kazakhstan and those countries. So we can avoid and uh, rely on the uh, on the foreign oil and gas in a very un politically unstable countries. So that would give us a high energy security. But uh, nuclear energy is not all good things. Actually, we have got additional costs. These are more important, perhaps, than the just you know generation costs and the price we I, we just saw. 
the, what is additional cost? Of course, you know, the proliferation is an you know, intangible cost we have to deal with. And then we have to have very advanced, stringent safeguards system. And also nuclear has got a very long lead time and a siding process. So that would cause lots of risk and investment. Assuring security, yes, that is another cost that we have to think about. And, and a shortage of workforce and knowledge preservation is getting harder and harder because uh, the young people do not go to the nuclear industry nowadays, and then a large portion of people retire, reaching the retiring age. So we have to you know, see this as, an, as another cost. And also ensuring public trust and communication and public outreach. You know, these are the indispensable for the nuclear industry uh, to, to prevail or to be accepted as a future energy source. So I just wanted to share this with you. What would be the keys for these challenges that we, 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 we are facing? First of all, just like we saw in the United States Energy Policy Act of 2005, we need a financial incentive. We need a sort of a, uh, investment stimulus, like a loan guarantee or a tax uh, credit. Those will be very useful for the utility companies to put the money on, on the nuclear uh, new build. Regulatory stability, yes, and lots of vendors are facing serious challenges and because and often the regulation can change and it could cause long delay in, 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 in building a nuclear plants and also sometimes facing up some kind of unnecessary litigation. So the uh, regulatory stability is very important. And the carbon cost, well, we expect the carbon cost is going to high up and we're going to have a perhaps in the carbon tax. That means that would put the nuclear in a much, much better competitive position. Political leadership is not necessary, of course, because of the proliferation concern or waste disposal. These are conducted, these are necessary led by the political leadership. So these are the ones which we have to keep. Multilateral, multinational collaboration, just like a global nuclear energy partnership led by United States government. Yes, we need you know, that kind of multinational collaboration in order to maximize the resource available and R&D effort, rather than duplicating you know, the R&D efforts amongst all developed nuclear developed nations. And finally, we need innovation in technical control and management. This is very important, especially under the very constrained world we are living now in terms of the resource, infrastructure, what we can solve these challenges. We need a kind of really innovative mind. In fact, the nuclear sector is one of the most, most conventional sort of conservative people's gathering. So in order to maximize the value they have already, or you know, in order to keep our good energy supply for future by nuclear energy, we need a kind of innovation in their, in their, in their control and management system. So with this, I just stop here, and I hope that you know, I delivered. So what is the real economy for nuclear? It's not just a cash and return. There's all costs we have to think about. Thank you. Next, Dr. Lyman. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, CG for the opportunity to speak here and uh, Dr. Finley for his um, excellent overview. Um, I will be going to some of the same um, issues that he discussed, but hopefully in a little more detail. Um, I was asked to talk about uh, technical issues associated with the future of nuclear energy. I um, come from the Union of Concerned Scientists, and I just want to say a little bit about um, our organization's position on nuclear energy. We're a large um, uh, science-based non-governmental organization uh, headquartered in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and uh, we've been involved in aspects of regulating uh, nuclear power since the birth of the organization in the late 1960s. Our position has always been uh, studiously neutral on nuclear energy, but that said, we are skeptics, and we believe that without a robust um, regulatory system, both domestically and internationally, there are concerns about whether or not nuclear energy uh, can be safe and secure enough to be a viable energy uh, resource uh, and be expanded worldwide. So that said, let's see, how do we... Uh... Right. Sure. So to talk about um, 
what are the constraints on a large-scale worldwide expansion of nuclear energy? Well, it's, it's the four horsemen that we've already heard about um, this morning. It's uh, safety, uh, security, waste disposal, and um, proliferation. Now, the overriding concern, in my mind, is whether or not we can see significant increases in all uh, with regard or improvements with regard to all these factors and also uh, maintain or achieve nuclear energy expansion at a reasonable cost. And these two are inseparable because it really does boil down in a large sense to uh, economic considerations and whether or not the additional costs associated with additional safety and security regulations uh, can be internalized in the cost of nuclear energy and not drive it up so that it's even less competitive than it is now. And I'd just like to say that in the United States today, uh, compared to uh, Japan, nuclear energy is not a competitive source, and this is why the utilities need um, the loan guarantees to the tune of 50 or even $100 billion, plus uh, substantial tax credits and other incentives, before Wall Street will even think about uh, providing any capital to build this next generation of nuclear plants. So if it really were a reliable, predictable, and, and low-cost alternative, uh, utilities would not need to be going to the U.S. government for this magnitude of handout. So it already is not uh, economic uh, today, and the question is if we were to address these issues with the seriousness that I think they need to be addressed, uh, is there any hope that it's going to be economic in the future? So the big question is, can nuclear energy be made safer, more secure, more proliferation resistant, and cheaper at the same time? And I think there is a possibility of that, but not in the current direction that uh, we're heading, at least in the United States. And I hope you'll apologize if my presentation is largely US-centric, because you know, um, I don't know how to use this thing. I must have put it on a timer. Sorry? I just want to advance one bullet at a time. Right, okay. okay. So the second big question in my mind is, how big a role can technical innovation play in resolving these concerns? And it may be an obvious point. <sighs> All right, my first experience with animation. How do you go backward now? Mm -hmm. It's not working. Okay, all right, so I should be pointing that direction. No, it's like, mm -hmm. is that the end of the slide? Go right, perfect. Okay. Well, I want to go to the previous slide. Oh. It seems to be skipping. Sorry about the technical uh, difficulties that could be solved with innovation. Um, it seems to be an obvious point, but technical advances in certain circumstances can help, but regulatory, political, and economic concerns are always going to be paramount. And why I bring this up is because there seems to be, at least uh, in many quarters, a, a heady technical optimism about the promise of nuclear energy, both in the United States and elsewhere, uh, which I think is, is largely overhyped. And uh, to the extent that uh, policymakers continue to hold out the promise of technical solutions to problems that obviously cannot be addressed simply through technical means, I think uh, that's a serious uh, concern. And certainly in the media debate, uh, that's a lot of what you hear, and I think it's leading to a very, uh, it's a very misleading direction. Now, just to address what the status of safety is, at least in the United States today, with today's reactors, is that we have 104 operating plants. Um, now, many of these plants were originally sited in relatively remote areas. In fact, the siting requirements from uh, the uh, uh, regulators did require them to be placed in low population zones, but due to uh, rampant uh, sprawl and suburbanization, uh, a number of nuclear plants in the United States now have rapidly expanding populations within the 10-mile emergency planning zones, and that actually does affect the, the safety profile quite a bit. Now, 
just going by industry's own data as calculated by uh, the probabilistic risk assessments, you look at the sum over this entire population of plants, the risk of a core melt, um, a Three Mile Island type accident, or worse, is about 1% per year. So you can see that there really isn't much room to expand uh, the population of nuclear plants in the United States unless the new generation of plants has a substantially lower risk of meltdown. Now, I just want to talk about what uh, the stakes are. I did a calculation uh, a study back in 2004 looking at the consequences of a large radiological release at the Indian Point nuclear plant, which is about uh, 25 miles north of, nuclear, uh, of uh, New York City. And on this, this is a population uh, diagram. You can see the red mark on this denotes uh, where Manhattan is set directly south of the reactor. There are about 300,000 people within 10 miles of the plant and roughly 16 million within 50 miles of the plant. Uh, my calculations indicated that there would be up to 44,000 deaths from acute radiation syndrome uh, in the short term, that is, in the matter of uh, days to weeks after this kind of an event. There would be uh, up over 500,000 cancer deaths in the long term as a result, and economic damage is exceeding $1 trillion, which would then clearly dwarf uh, the impact of the September 11th attacks, uh, both in terms of loss of life uh, and economic damages. Also, the uh, potential for exposure of children many hundreds of miles downwind of the site to radioactive iodine, as we did see in the Chernobyl accident. And here's a, a picture I took at, uh, in the town of Pripyat last year, right outside of the Chernobyl plant. You can see what the impact of uh, uh, cesium fallout can be even 20 years after uh, an accident. So obviously, this is the kind of thing that we uh, really cannot tolerate a, a higher risk than we have now. And so a reasonable principle might be that regulators should require the next generation of nuclear plants to be demonstrably safer than the current generation. The ways to achieve this would be to have greater margins to safety limits than we do now. That is, uh, a more comfortable uh, region between the maximum temperatures you might predict in a loss of coolant accident and the temperatures at which the core uh, might, uh, safety of the core might be challenged. More defense in depth, meaning more redundant measures to compensate in case your first backup system fails, you have others to rely on. You might also want to think about restricting the unbridled growth of population near nuclear power plants or to site new ones in areas that will not uh, see increases in population. And also emergency planning measures that should address, address the population that is truly at risk which is a, a far cry from uh, at least the United States policy where the 10-mile circular um, annulus around the reactor is only is the region where evacuation planning and, and potassium iodide distribution is considered. So it's a reasonable principle, but at least in the United States we have an unreasonable regulator, and that would be the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And back in 1986, they released a policy on advanced reactors where they essentially endorsed the status quo. They said uh, they expect that the next generation of reactors should be at least as safe as the current generation. And the longer term, they expect things should get better. But they didn't require it. And that we're dealing with the legacy of that policy uh, today. And um, uh, just to show an example, I'd like to have a tale of two reactors. One is the AP-1000. Westinghouse uh, design advanced pressurized water reactor, which received a design certification by the NRC in uh, 2005. The other is was originally called the European pressurized water reactor um, and is now being marketed in the U.S. as the evolutionary pressurized water reactor. That was uh, designed in Europe uh, to meet uh, European requirements, which had a, a, did not embrace the principle that reactors should not be any safer in the future than they are now. And so taking the example of the AP-1000, well, it's an example of a reactor that has a passive cooling system uh, as opposed to active cooling. That is, you don't require the active operation of pumps, valves, or, or motors to uh, cool the core in the event of a loss of coolant. You use gravity. And that, in principle, could be uh, safer uh, than the current 
uh, generation, possibly not as safe as the designers are building it, but, are billing it, but it could be potentially safer. And the, the design does fix some obvious flaws in the present generation of reactors, um, and at least on paper, and that's because the AP1000 still exists only on paper, it looks like it's 100 times safer than the current generation of plants. But this gain in safety was offset by weakening safety features elsewhere to slash construction costs of this reactor. So for instance, uh, significantly less concrete and steel uh, are going to be used in the construction of the reactor that leads to less robust containment building, leads to less redundancy in safety systems because there are fewer backup safety systems available, and there are also smaller safety margins, and lower quality standards is another way reactor designers are, are uh, approaching cutting costs if you have fewer systems that have to meet the highest uh, quality control standards, then you can cut costs, but you have systems that are less reliable. And uh, the other story with the AP1000 is that it was uprated from an original design called the AP600. Uh, it was, the original thinking was you couldn't have a passively cooled reactor of 1,000 megawatts. You would want to make it smaller so that the actual heat removal uh, requirements were less. But no one wanted to buy this reactor because the economics were terrible. Uh, the way the uh, economics were improved was to upgrade it to over a thousand megawatts to try to get the economies of scale. Uh, but the size and strength of the containment building was not increased proportionately. And in fact, all the issues you might think associated with scaling, very complicated uh, thermal hydraulic analyses from a small reactor to a larger one were not addressed adequately in the licensing in my view. Uh, so the ultimate outcome is that this reactor NRC decided is less tolerant of equipment failures than the AP600 was. That is essentially a definition of uh, that it has less defense and depth than the original reactor. Now, what we've done is we've traded defense and depth for greater uncertainty, which is the opposite direction. Because if you have greater uncertainty, you have a paper design, uh, you have no operating experience, you have passive systems which are actually harder to calculate how they might act in an accident than active systems, and you're not sure that you, you're aware of every accident sequence that's out there. You've uh, obtained greater uncertainty. The way to deal with that is usually to increase defense in depth. If you don't know something, you might want to add an additional backup just to be sure that uh, in the case that you're wrong about your original predi prediction, but the AP1000 went in the other direction. Now, contrasting that with the EPR, this was designed uh, to meet a safety standards that were laid out by the Germans and the French for the next generation of reactors to address the risk of severe accidents. And so it has a number of features that um, could actually substantially increase safety. The containment is double-walled. It has four backup uh, independent trains of cooling as opposed to two, which is the norm. It has what's known as a core catcher that is, in case the core overheats, melts the, the reactor vessel, there's a system to try to maintain that in a state where it can be easily cooled, as opposed to the case where it just drops down into the containment floor in a state where you don't know if you can keep it cool and it can continue to, to overheat and, and melt. Um, but the price of these improvements is, is high. In fact, the, one, uh, the first EPR that's being built in Finland right now is already looking like it'll be 50% more costly than its $4 billion price tag. Um, so you do have to pay uh, to get greater safety, in my view. Now, the issue of security is another one that's been a great concern of ours since well before September 11th. Um, and this is the fact that no matter how safe your plant looks on paper um, or how safe it is with regard to accidents, if there's a dedicated knowledgeable team of adversaries uh, who go attacks the plant, they can actually simulate an accident that might not have occurred within 10 or 100,000 years if left to chance. But if you know what to do, you can make that accident happen and mimic perhaps the worst possible event, a Chernobyl-type event. Current plant designs were not, uh, uh, back in the 60s and 70s, did not consider this risk. And so you're left with a number of vulnerabilities that uh, that we're dealing with today. For instance, some plants, uh, if a terrorist knew the right place to place a single explosive charge, they could disable both primary and backup coolant systems, and therefore you get 
uh, more bang for your buck and, in fact, create what's called a common mode failure, which could lead more quickly to a meltdown. That isn't good design from a safety perspective either, for instance, if you had a fire in that room, but certainly from a security perspective, it's the wrong thing to do. And to compensate for these vulnerabilities, you need guns, guards, and gates. And uh, after September 11th, we've seen uh, fairly substantial increases in the number of uh, armed security responders at nuclear power plants, their capabilities, uh, the um, hardening of the protected area boundaries of these plants, uh, but unfortunately, it's really not enough because the U.S., for example, and nowhere else, as far as I know, has adequately dealt with the threat from the air that we saw on September 11th. On September 11th, American Airlines Flight 11 passed directly over Indian Point, uh, the reactor I was talking about earlier in New York State. And the reason why we know now from the 9-11 Commission report Al-Qaeda did not plan on attacking that reactor was because they were afraid it would be shot down because they thought that air, the airspace around nuclear power plants was protected. Well, they were wrong. They were wrong then. In fact, they would still be wrong today because it's still not protected, uh, except uh, no nuclear power plant in the United States has a no-fly zone around it in comparison to places like Walt Disney World or Dick Cheney's summer house in, in, uh, in the Maryland shore. Um, so we do have this outstanding problem. Uh, but you don't need a plane to attack a nuclear plant. Like I said, a threat from the ground is adequate. And in fact, the additional standards put into place after September 11th do not deal with attacks on the size and scale of the 9-11 attack. That is, four separate adversary teams each with four or five members each. The number of adversaries that are considered when designing security systems now is much smaller than that. And in fact, even against that smaller team, security forces still continue to fail at a, a substantial rate. The types of weapons that the so-called design bases attackers are considered to have are not, do not contain in some uh, cases weapons that are commonly available on the black market and they're used uh, routinely in warfare today, like these rocket-propelled grenades. Um, and in addition to the failings in applying external, additional external security, we're, we seem to be losing the opportunity to design security into the next generation of plants. Because even though the NRC, like with safety, it has the opportunity to require additional security measures to be built into the plant designs, their policy is that that will not happen. The U.S. NRC decided not to require new plants to be able to withstand uh, the, an attack from an air crash. However, reactor designers have to think about it. And um, they might get scared enough that they'll do something about it, but they don't have to do something about it. They just have to think about it. And that's part of, the, you know, part of this trend toward more voluntary measures and using shame uh, to try to uh, shame the shameless. Um, and in fact, there is dissent from within the NRC. Uh, one of the commissioners, Greg Yatsko, uh, believes strongly that it doesn't make any sense to build a plant today unless it can be uh, withstand an air an attack like we saw on September 11th, and so, but he's in the minority. Now, the other two horsemen of the nuclear renaissance, uh, one nuclear waste disposal, which we've heard about again, it is a major unresolved issue with nuclear power. No country has yet secured a license for uh, a, a long-lived waste repository. In fact, there's really no demonstration that the obstacles, which are both political and technical in nature can be overcome. And so this raises the policy issue, is it sensible to build more nuclear power plants if we don't have a credible way uh, to dispose of the waste in a way that we can assure safety? And in fact, um, the answer to that is generally yes, including the United States, is that there's no requirement that you have to prove that you can dispose of the waste safely. There just has to be a sense that you probably can and in fact, in the United States, that sense is rapidly diminishing when you look at uh, the Yucca Mountain repository site, um, which has been um, besieged by problems. First, the Energy Department is badly bungling its attempt to prepare an application for this facility, uh, doing things like uh, its contractors falsifying quality assurance requirements for the computer codes they're using and then sending emails boasting about it that it fell into the hands of the FBI, for example. Um, 
Uh, the fact that Nevada, the state where the site is located, was marginal politically in the 1980s, but is now at the top of the Senate. Um, and technical issues, like um, we're almost at the, well, that's, this is a legal rather than technical issue. We already have enough spent fuel. We're going to exceed the yucca mountain capacity, the legal capacity, very soon. In fact, no, a technical issue which hasn't been dealt with is there are new requirements that the repository may have to function for a million years as opposed to 10,000, which was the original requirement. It's simply not clear. There's any kind of calculation anyone can do with a straight face that says we can predict what will happen a million years from now and, and submit it to a regulator. So this may be a technical hurdle that cannot be met. And one of the concerns uh, we have is that the stasis around Yucca Mountain and I just want to add that we don't necessarily support Yucca Mountain, per se. We believe uh, there are strict technical and, and um, political requirements that have to be met for a repository, but we do think that there will need to be a geologic repository for the waste we've already generated somewhere. We don't know if Yucca Mountain's the right site, but there needs to be consideration. And, but the flip side is, as Yucca Mountain, <coughs> sorry, as a Yucca Mountain founders, there are greater calls in the U.S. for reprocess. I'm just going to grab it. That there are increasing calls in the United States to reprocess spent fuel, um, and these advocates argue that that could actually um, improve both the capacity and the licensing of the repository. The idea is that if you remove the hottest elements from spent fuel, known as uh, the actinides, that the reduced heat load will ena enable you to cram more waste into the repository. And because what's left over is overall uh, shorter lived than the, uh, a lot of these actinides, that you could actually license the repository according to a shorter timeline. And our concern is that reprocessing is a dangerous, dirty, and expensive enterprise, which is uh, essentially um, a, a mistaken technology. The foremost concern, reprocessing, does increase the risk that plutonium and other weapons usable materials and spent fuel will fall into the hands of terrorists because you are separating it from the radiation and physical barriers associated with spent fuel assemblies and producing. Uh, plutonium in a concentrated and accessible form. Reprocessing also greatly increases the safety and environmental risks associated with nuclear energy generation at a time when we should be trying to achieve the opposite. Um, it does increase costs greatly compared to the ones through cycle, and I, I would like to clarify, if I heard the uh, previous speaker correctly, the Rakasha reprocessing plant um, actually is costing 22 billion U.S. dollars, and I think you said 2.2, but I'm not sure. I got wrong. Okay, but it's 22 billion, with making one of the most expensive industrial facilities in, in history, um, and it, it's overhyped to the extent it can achieve the objectives of its proponents, and it's very frustrating um, to try to make the uh, case against it when you're faced with advocates who talk about it as if it's as easy as recycling uh, your uh, newspapers, when it certainly isn't. One of the biggest problems associated with the U.S. recycling program is, is the use of uh, fast reactors, liquid metal fueled reactors. Here's a picture of the Fermi-1 reactor north of Detroit, uh, almost uh, had a severe accident back in the 1960s and could have threatened this entire region. Fast reactors are inherently unstable compared to light water reactors. In fact, if you hear the industry is saying a reactor can't blow up like a bomb. That's true for a light water reactor, but it's not true for a fast reactor. It's not going to be a very, not going to be a very high yield bomb, but the physical processes are not unlike those in a nuclear weapon. Um, and more plutonium in the core because fast reactors operate on plutonium fuel usually uh, increases the radiological consequences of an attack quite significantly. And I think I'm running out of time. Um, just a comment on Global Nuclear Energy Partnership. This is the Bush administration's attempt to restart reprocessing and uh, use of uh, and fast reactors in the United States. Uh, the claim of GINA is that we can design advanced reprocessing technologies that do not separate pure plutonium, therefore don't have the same 
proliferation of nuclear terrorism risks is conventional reprocessing. Our assessment is it's not likely to work. Um, this is something I, I stole from the Australians who aren't too happy about uh, their prime minister's uh, buy-in to the U.S. system here. Um, uh, my assessment is that no technology being analyzed under GNIP would make a significant impact on the security risks associated with reprocessing, and I can go into that at length if anyone's interested. And also, if you look at the, what it would actually take to achieve the goal of increasing the capacity of a repository by uh, a factor of 100, which is what ZOE is talking about, it would actually take centuries and expenditure of hundreds of billions of dollars. And this violates a, a key principle in nuclear waste disposal, which is intergenerational equity, is that we don't leave significant decisions and costs to future generations to deal with the waste we generate today. But if our great-great-grandchildren have to build a reprocessing plant, a new fast reactor, replace one uh, uh, that expired, uh, you know, 100, 150 years from now, or they're going to be stuck with a mass of actinides left over from uh, our generation, that does not, that fails this principle. Now, I'd just like to um, top off, since I am in Canada, I would like to mention, uh, we don't have time to get into the non-proliferation aspects, and Joe Sorenzione is going to be talking about them, but I would say that an alternative to the multinational uranium enrichment concepts that are floating around today is a non-discriminatory approach, which is to actually ban uranium enrichment and focus only on reactors that use natural uranium as a fuel. And uh, people immediately say this is a non-starter, but in my view, it's no less ridiculous than schemes like GINA, so, uh, and could actually be a whole lot simpler to implement if the technology is there. So here's a case where I do think technology can play a role. And uh, here's Canada's contribution to non-proliferation, is that obviously can do reactor is a prototype of a natural uranium-fueled reactor. It does have some significant issues with conventional design, so I would say R&D into how to improve the can-do on natural uranium would be warranted. That doesn't seem to be the direction anyone is going in, but it seems like a logical one, because if we could eliminate the need for uranium enrichment, uh, we obviously could uh, disentangle enrichment from uh, national acquisition of uh, nuclear energy and self-reliance in nuclear energy, and therefore it's something to think about. And the bottom line is our position is uh, we still have a lot of questions to answer before we can endorse nuclear as a large-scale um, uh, energy source for mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you. I'm sorry if I uh, went over to you. <laughs> Now Ms. Dodsma will speak um, about a field in which Canada has a great deal of experience, uh, environmental considerations. Thank you very much. Um, and in fact, I think you'll probably hear that very little of what I have to say actually deals with environment, but let me explain that further. This, uh, this conference is certainly a very timely one in considering the nexus between energy policy and security and environmental security. As energy demand continues to grow, it's at a time when climate change is actually forcing us to face the inevitability of a carbon-constrained world, and thus global climate disruption has actually, uh, and to many people surprisingly, opened the door for discussion about a potential nuclear renaissance. Certainly over the past 15 years that I have uh, had some engagement with this field, not with nuclear, but with, uh, with climate change and environment, uh, this is really the first time where we've actually seen the word nu nuclear uh, uttered in climate change and environmental uh, fora. And mention was made of some of the uh, uh, the recent decisions, uh, the recent uh, comments that were made not only by the uh, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which indicated that uh, if we are to meet our objectives at all as a world community, uh, we're going to have to make more investment in nuclear, uh, but also the recent inter-academy report and, uh, and others that were mentioned by previous speakers. You've also heard, of course, that there are those who advocate that 
Uh, nuclear is at present the only large, uh, safe, large-scale energy source available for baseload power and that it's already uh, avoiding uh, a very significant uh, production of 2 million metric tons. And lining up behind those people are formerly uh, well-known environmental spokespersons like uh, Patrick Moore, formerly of Greenpeace, and the Gayu guru from uh, the UK, James Lovelock. And in Canada, we see a very soothing corporate advocacy campaign saying nuclear is clean, it's affordable, it's reliable. But as was just suggested by the previous speaker, uh, there, is, uh, there certainly remain many challenges, and one of those is certainly public acceptance. Whether it's because of the fear of human error, such as occurred at Chernobyl, or the technical failure that some perceive uh, at Three Mile Island, it is very real in the minds of citizens, and that cannot be ignored. Add to that the threat of terrorism, the nuclear weapons ambitions of so many states, and proliferation, and you'll see why I take a much broader view of the word environment uh, than, uh, than simply the physical environment. I think in the minds of the public, in fact, uh, the public uses the word environment in the various, very broadest sense. Uh, the words health, safety, environment become almost interchangeable. And just as an example, in the recent provincial election campaign, uh, our local Greenpeace unveiled their highlight uh, top 10 list of nuclear threats to the environment. And that list included investment in nuclear power is a threat to the development of renewables, nuclear power is a terrorist target, nuclear power is not safe, nuclear power is unreliable, nuclear power can make nuclear weapons, nuclear power is expensive, nuclear power is unpopular, nuclear power is slow to build, nuclear power produces radioactive waste, and there's no fail-safe way of isolating that waste for a million years. And finally, plants emit radioactive emissions and exposures, uh, in increasing the exposures rather to risk of cancer and birth defects. Interestingly, of that list of 10 threats to the environment, I think probably only one could be considered uh, a threat to what we would commonly refer to as the physical environment. There certainly are environmental concerns, and let me not minimize those at all. They range from uh, whether or not we have an adequate understanding of the full life cycle analysis, including emissions not only uh, from reactor construction, but from mining, and then from the actual operation of plants. Uh, they deal with radioactive tailings and leftover sludge, contamination of groundwater. Uh, someone has already mentioned the fact that reactors are very heavy users of water. Uh, they are sources of both routine and accidental releases of radionuclides, sulfur dioxide, volatile organics, and so forth. And of course, uh, we're left with radioactive waste, with highly toxic substances, and some with very long half-lives. But I think that arguably most would agree that we are capable of managing these environmental risks. We know a lot about uh, setting up long-term monitoring of health and environmental effects. And we do, at least in Canada, have a regulatory regime where there is an environmental assessment process that exposes these risks and demands some form of mitigation. Now, there is much to be said about whether or not in implementation uh, those are as good as they are in practice. But my point is that perhaps even more challenging are all of the social and ethical concerns, both real and perceived, around questions about whether or not there's a future for nuclear. Uh, I think it's fundamentally uh, around the question of how do we make good public policy decisions. And so I want to focus for just a few moments using the case specifically of nuclear waste and perhaps telling you a little bit about what the last four years of my life have been like in trying to uh, advise the Canadian government as to what approach we might take in Canada for the long-term care and management of our high-level nuclear waste. 
Uh, as has already been alluded to, um, it's a, an issue of scientific and technical complexity. It's also an issue that has the potential to inspire fear and insecurity and certainly to polarize citizens. And in this country, it's perceived as a barrier, not knowing what to do with it, a barrier to this uh, possible discussion or development of new nuclear. This is also at a time when research shows clearly that public trust in governments and major initiatives, uh, major institutions rather, uh, has clearly been eroded and society's expectations about their involvement in decision-making processes is much more intense and sophisticated than it ever was at the time when uh, nuclear was first developed. I want to stress that in the work we've done over the past number of years, we were neither advocate nor apologist for the nuclear industry. And that's particularly important we had to be seen to be objective if we were in fact uh, to do our work. So let me set the context. Canada, like most other nuclear producing countries, has examined this uh, question for several years. When used nuclear fuel is removed from the reactor, it's highly radioactive, requiring proper shielding and careful handling to protect both humans and the environment. In Canada, we have about 2 million used fuel bundles. Uh, for those of you uh, who, don't have a, uh, who, who want a visual sense of that, it's about the equivalent of uh, five hockey rinks with the uh, fuel bundles laid end to end. Uh, and they are uh, safely stored at licensed facilities at the reactor sites. But we also know that as the radioactivity decreases with time, used nuclear fuel remains uh, a potential health and safety security hazard uh, for thousands of years, and in our report we say essentially indefinitely. We've had for the last four years the privilege and the challenge of engaging with Canadians in an attempt to find an approach that would work. And I say privilege because there is an inherent wisdom among citizens that I think policymakers would be very wise to tap. And of course I say challenge because of the issues that I've just mentioned and the fact that, uh, as Bob would attest to in the past, uh, any other attempts have actually not resulted in decisions being taken on this question of what to do with uh, the long-term management. One of our main goals was to actually gather and document the terms and conditions that would make such a project acceptable to society at large, and then to reflect in our recommendations a fundamental consideration of our respect for those factors. In other words, we, we started from the premise that we would have to achieve a social license to operate, and that, that was our starting point. We were often asked during the course of our work why it is that we thought it necessary to consider the ethical and social aspects of nuclear waste management at all. Surely, to goodness, all you're looking for is the technically best solution. Wouldn't that do? Well, the simplest answer is, of course, that members of the public, in my view, have a right to be engaged in discussion about matters that fundamentally affect their lives. As importantly, I think the real answer lies in how we as a society actually manage risk. The NWMO began its study with the understanding that technical and scientific specialists could actually articulate the risk, the nature of the risk, could help us understand the adequacy of the approaches, and perhaps even suggest ways of mitigating that risk. However, we strongly believed that the analysis of scientific and technical evidence, while essential, could not be the sole determining factor in our decision as to what recommendation we would put forward to government. So we started with a mission that was actually a case study in sustainable development. We said that we wanted to find recommendations that would be, sustain that would be socially acceptable, uh, technically sound, environmentally responsible, economically feasible, 
and, of course, would take into account the, uh, the, the point of intergenerational equity. Even our analytical framework in looking at the options that were on the table had only one objective that was related to the technology. There were eight objectives, and the other ones related to environmental integrity, to social and ethical concerns such as community well-being and fairness. Another reason for considering ethical and social issues really had to do with the time dimension. I mean, I, I for one, could never get over the fact that effectively we were being asked to do public policy for a period of time longer than recorded history. And as was suggested, that's just a little bit humbling uh, to think about what you can do. We clearly uh, came up with uh, uh, an answer that says we, we, re we need a little humility. We do what we, can, what we know about and what we can do for periods of time, and we leave ourselves the option to say go and no go over a lengthy process uh, over the years. But uh, clearly, we need to start down that path, but we don't have all the answers. Values and ethics, deeply held beliefs, matter essentially and are absolutely central to the policy decisions we ultimately make on this controversial issue, and I would suggest even on the issue of the future of nuclear. Since ethical questions rarely have unambiguous or definitive answers, past attempts have been to resolve them through technical arguments, and that is exactly what has failed around the world. As in any complex issue, it's the trade-offs among competing objectives that are going to be inevitable. And it's not simply good enough to say, well, that's your view and it doesn't count and it doesn't matter and I won't listen to it. In order to best determine and then satisfy the primary obje objectives of such a large socio-scientific project as this, the process must be transparent, open to input from any and all points of view, and rigorously discussed in genuine dialogue. That is, after all, in my view, uh, what we mean by uh, a democratic process uh, with integrity. Ultimately, it's society at large that's going to decide which risks it's prepared to accept. So as I said, while sciences, scientists and experts can articulate the nature of the risk, can suggest ways of mitigating it, ultimately the choice is going to be up to society. I want to just mention four or five things that we learned from this process and that may or may not be helpful in the larger debate about whether we engage fully in the future of nuclear. The first is that we found that the public is actually both capable and pragmatic. While they may lack awareness and technical knowledge about the characteristics of used nuclear fuel and the technological choices available, our experience certainly was that citizens could participate very effectively in designing a path forward. In fact, we found that common ground emerged, and much to the surprise of many, citizens and experts essentially came up with several things in common and it was on that base that we actually built our recommendation. They felt a responsibility to deal with the waste that we've created and to take action now. They did not think that this was a legacy that should be or could be left to future generations. They saw safety and security and fairness as the preeminent objectives of all of the ones we looked at. <coughs> and they wanted flexibility they are eternal technological optimists. They look back and say, we didn't have cell phones and numerous other things 10 years ago uh, that, it, it, that have become so fundamental to our ways of life. What's to make us think that 50 or 100 years from now, there aren't a bunch of smart people in a room somewhere that can actually do something to take the hazard out of this waste product that we have? They also were very smart in saying, not only do we not know what technology choices are going to be available to us, we have no idea how society is going to change. 
In fact, when we were designing the, um, the uh, financial formula for the waste owners, uh, people said, and we talked about trust funds and where they were being housed, people said to us, but how do you even know 100 years from now that there will be such financial institutions as banks, for example? Or uh, how do you know what kind of language with which we'll be able to communicate? The only thing that we have to go by, uh, the only man-made structures that we have to go by that give you any sense of longevity are things like the pyramids, for example. What kind of language do you want to identify the hazard of any future nuclear waste site? So the public demonstrated consistently that it's both capable and willing of actually thinking through those difficult trade-offs and that they understand decisions are going to have to be taken at a dynamic and, and uh, adaptive way over time. Three other quick things. The public gravitates toward a precautionary approach. Um, and although certainly within our government circles, the concept of precautionary approach slash precautionary principle is uh, itself very complex, uh, the public instantly comes to it with that mindset. And why? because they simply are humble about the state of our current knowledge and the uncertainties over time. Fourthly, uh, the public's trust is most easily built through inclusiveness and diversity. Virtually every exercise that we undertook, and we did literally dozens of them, uh, ranging from scenarios as, such as were discussed earlier to a national citizens dialogue on values, for example, but virtually everything we did, we ensured that there was a diversity of perspective at the table because we felt that ultimately you would never have a genuine dialogue if you had like minds talking to like minds. We created situations where people actually were forced to listen to others and to learn from others around the table. So that's why we developed um, an iterative process over the three years that exposed our thinking as it evolved, that was totally transparent, that actually at, on four different occasions tested and validated in a stepwise fashion what we were doing and sought that genuine dialogue. The fifth thing we learned is that implementation is actually what's very key. Uh, that was what was upper mind in the, uh, in the minds of people. Uh, they wanted to talk about the decision-making process, the institutions, the systems that would have to be put in place, issues of financial surety, how citizens would be involved on an ongoing basis, as much as they wanted to talk about any technical requirement. So the approach, the recommendation we came up with, essentially called adaptive phase management, took the best of both of those it said our approach must not simply be uh, a technical uh, fix because there isn't a technical fix. The technical component of it is isolation and containment deep underground. But what is important is the management approach that surrounds it. And that means that it will be constantly monitored, that it will be retrievable, that it provides genuine choice, that, that we're a, a corporation that's built on continuous learning, um, and that uh, there will be sequential and collective decision-making that provides the capacity for the learning to be passed from one generation to another. Most importantly, I think it's an example of a public policy recommendation that is fundamentally rooted in social values and ethics as they have been expressed to us. And I'm delighted to say that this what I would call both responsive and responsible recommendation was accepted by the government in June. The corporation will now move to uh, perhaps the more difficult stage, which is the stage of actually getting involved in a collaborative siting process. But again, what uh, the waste owners and the corporation have committed themselves to do is to make sure that we continue to live by the values that we have already expressed and that we continue to do so in a collaborative way. We are profoundly aware of the imperative to earn the trust of Canadians. There is no reservoir of trust and confidence at this time. 
and the public is simply not prepared to delegate decision-making responsibility to any one expert or specialist group, including government. History has shown us, in fact, that no agency, private or public, has adequately understood and dealt with the entire breadth of objectives that seem to be important to citizens, ranging from economic feasibility, technical soundness, as we've heard this morning, but also moving to environmental integrity, safety, security, and fairness. And I believe that only a very deliberative process that transparently considers those multiple perspectives is actually going to be considered uh, trustworthy uh, of protecting the public interest. Let me just end by saying that uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't recognize the many participants in our process who wanted to make their views known about the broader question of the future of nuclear energy. It was not a focus of our study. We did not examine it or make a judgment about the future. In fact, we said very clearly that those decisions must be the subject of their own assessment and public process in this country. The thing that we did, however, was to allow people to express their views and for our own integrity and credibility, we actually recorded those views, we passed those along, and the mere process that we had established of allowing the public to be heard on these matters was enough so that at the end of our exercise, when we made our recommendation to government, in fact, we still had all of our critics around the table engaged as part of the process. We said that from our perspective, the fact is that used fuel now exists and we have an ethical obligation uh, to deal with that uh, uh, fuel at this time. We are resolute in our belief that we know enough today to start down this uh, complex path, but we're also humble enough to recognize that there are many ways in which we can be redirected on this path to know that at every step of the journey, we need to continue to earn the trust and uh, retain the trust and confidence of Canadians. And I would suggest that, uh, that as we debate this fundamental issue, at least in our country, of the future of nuclear power, these are important lessons uh, that might prove to be helpful as we have that debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, we have uh, approximately 30 to 35 minutes for uh, questions. I don't know if there are mics available on the floor. If not, I invite you to speak loudly so as to overcome the ambient noise and identify yourself when you speak. I think, ah, I see a mic and I see a first hand way back there. You need the mic, believe me. Attaboy, Bill. Just just stand up and head. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you, Reverend. Is that Carrie all right? My name's Don Johnston, and from 1996 to 2006, I was the Secretary General of the OECD. Just and a bit in, louder, please. Sorry, and in the family of the OECD, there is the Nuclear Energy Agency, uh, with which I work very closely. Now, my questions and comments are really more directed, I think, to uh, Dr. Lyman. Um, I happen to have grown up, since I'm older than probably nearly everybody in this room, in a period known as Atoms for Peace. This was in the post-war period, notwithstanding the atom bomb, this was seen by the energy of the future. And until Three Mile Island, and of course subsequently uh, Chernobyl, um, I think these are the ones that created a serious problem for us in terms of public opinion. And we heard earlier from Mr. Finley that one more disastrous event might really, as we say sometimes, deep six a nuclear energy. But all of us seem to bring a bias to this debate, and I have one, because I'm actually very favorable to nuclear energy for the same reasons as Jim Lovelock, with whom I've had many discussions on this subject over the years, because frankly, if we had not lost a generation of nuclear power, we would not be as concerned about climate change as we are today. And unfortunately, it would appear that uh, no matter how much effort we put into reconstructing the, the nuclear parks all over the world, time is out on our side. We've heard of that as well. 
But Mr. Lyman produced a number of, of, uh, of issues, raised a number of very legitimate issues. But one of my questions to him is, for example, the scientific community obviously is divided because Nobel Prize winner Sir Britton Richter from Stanford is a very big proponent of nuclear energy, has been trying to push this, saying we've lost a generation, it's important to move forward. The security issues can be addressed, the waste disposal issues can be addressed, no CO2 emissions. And your numbers surprise me a little bit because, in fact, the numbers that he produces show that in terms of fatalities, there's only one safer source of energy today, and that's wind power. In other words, per kilowatt hour produced. You came up with a figure saying that uh, there was a 1% chance of a meltdown. And I'd be interested in knowing where that number comes from. So there are 109 reactors in the United States. Does that mean we should expect one to go down every year? Or what, where does the number come from? Because I'm not aware of any meltdowns recently, and certainly not in France, where I've been for the last 10 years. Over 80% of the electricity, not power, but electricity in France, Okay, you've, you've, you've come to a question. I'll invite Dr. Well, Lyman the first to, question uh, I ask, I'd like to ask is... Where uh, is it excuse me, but uh, I think I'd like to let Dr. Lyman answer this question. And, oh, fine. Okay. And, you're, uh, and then I'll go on to the next questioner. <clears throat> Sorry, the question is where did the figure come from? The, the uh, core damage frequency? Well, the, the average core damage frequency is determined by the industry's probabilistic risk assessments, that is, the level one estimates of the uh, probability of core damage per year. The average in the United States is around 2 times 10 to the minus fifth for internal events. Internal events meaning only those events that would result from some incident within a plant system. Then there is also the matter of external events including earthquakes, uh, tornadoes, floods, et cetera, which are generally believed to be about the same order of magnitude as the internal events. Then there are the shutdown events. And that's, it turns out that the, the um, risk when the reactor's operating um, is roughly comparable to the risk when the reactor's shut down, even though on average the reactor's shut down for a much smaller period. And that's because during a refueling, the fuel is still hot uh, but the containment's open. So it turns out that it's believed that that's also roughly the same order of magnitude. So you're talking about around 2 times 10 to the minus 5th times 4 brings you to around uh, just under 1 times 10 to the minus 4th times 100 plants is about 1% per year. Now that kind of calculation, of course, I criticize um, people who put too much faith in that, usually from the other direction, because there are no error bars. One of the problems with probabilistic risk assessment is they don't know how to quantify the uncertainties appropriately. And of course, by citing the central value or average value uh, and not saying anything about the size of the error bars, you don't know, um, you know the range you're talking about. So generally, you'd have to expect there's at least an order of magnitude in either direction. But, and so therefore, not seeing an event, and some people may argue whether or not Three Mile Island was or was not that once in a uh, hundred year event. Uh, without knowing what the uncertainties are, you can't say the, what the absence of the event proves about the validity of your central value because you need to know what the confidence level is. So, so the absence of an event doesn't necessarily prove or disprove anything about that figure, but those are based on the industry's own probabilistic risk assessment calculations. Okay, Bill Graham and then over here and then over there, Bill. Uh, Bill Graham, former foreign minister, I want to ask a question which ties in with the global governance issues we've been discussing up till now. Some of us in the room may recall that at Kananaska Summit, uh, Canada and the United States and all the members agreed to provide Russia with $10 billion over 10 years, so the taxpayers in this room are contributing $100 million a year to Russia to clean up nuclear waste in Russia, largely a military lake located at Murmansk as a result of their Navy and, and other issues, but it was pretty horrifying both to see those sites and the degree of nuclear waste just lying around and exposed in very dangerous conditions to the point where we were worried about a nuclear submarine tied up to the dock blowing up. Uh, so what I'd be interested in really is a, is a case study. We, we, we negotiated at Kananaska as the foreign ministers had a huge trouble with the Russians getting a satisfactory agreement 
people to follow the money trail and to make sure that there was going to be an effective use of the billion dollars a year that we were collectively contributing. But I would have thought this would be a very good case study to have a look at, both from a global governance but also from this issue, as to know what is the success of this and whether we're actually getting any. Because if there's no success of a, of, of a situation like that, I'd be a little more despaired about uh, the possibility of success as we get into the global ramifications, apart from you know the, Cana the local Canadian ones, Elizabeth, of how we deal with waste. So does anybody in the panel know anything about where we are on that? And is anybody effectively following it? And where's our $100 million a year going and that sort of thing? I throw it open to the panel. I can't answer that question uh, specifically, but I do want to say that actually the, uh, the high-level nuclear waste management community internationally is really very small. And uh, there is very good communication among those who are searching for solutions to learn from each other. It's a case where, in fact, I think countries are not trying to reinvent the wheel. Canada, for example, is very much working with and learning from Sweden, Finland, uh, Switzerland, and others, of course, our neighbor to the south as well. But I think it's precisely why, I'm sure Louise would tell you, uh, there is a question about whether the international regime is adequate enough to do exactly as you're, as you're implying. Sir? Hello, Keith Heifel from Siege in the University of Waterloo. I'd like to thank all three speakers for an excellent presentation. I'd especially like to thank our American colleague for pointing out that Canada does indeed... Too close? Oh. I'd especially like, right. like to thank our American colleague for pointing out that Canada has a wonderful nuclear reactor called CANDU, some very excellent future designs. Now the question that I have is actually a political economic one which I think is closely tied to safety and other issues. We do build a very good reactor. Let me say for our Japanese colleague, Canadians love Japanese co cameras and other high quality products. We build a high quality nuclear reactor. Why has Japan, for example, not bought the Kando reactor in the past? <laughs> Anyone want to? That is an excellent question. Thank you. Uh, I cannot speak on behalf of a utility company so why we haven't purchased your excellent candle reactor in the past. But <laughs> um, well, we have got some um, about some. Um, well, we have 55 reactors, and then 60% of reactors are, 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 are PWR, and the rest of the BWR in Japan. And um, in fact, the candle reactors. Um, I think it's uh, one of the concerns we had is the candle reactors. Uh, uh, use uh, fresh ure uranium, and um, and then there is some high proliferation concern in the past, and I think that could be the, one of the reasons why. why but well, um, well, maybe I better stop there. I, I don't know. Perhaps uh, maybe some other business reason. <laughs> And also, yeah, there's one more thing that, so, uh, you know, we have got the, the Japanese vendors and the three major vendors and the Toshiba, Hitachi, and Mitsubishi. Those are uh, uh, having a consortium with uh, Western vendors like uh, Westinghouse or uh, 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 GE in the past. So through their consortium, we've been uh, producing, manufacturing our own reactor design and reactor itself. So there is a market that's pretty competitive in terms of the other foreign uh, vendors' uh, uh, products coming to the nuclear uh, in, in Japanese nuclear market. Maybe that's another reason why. Sorry, can I, can I respond to that very briefly? Please. Uh, before we get too carried away, I did a uh, uh, caveat that can do re design, at least the uh, uh, original can do designs, have some serious issues. And so my suggestion was that uh, they work to resolve them. Uh, for instance, you couldn't license a natural uranium fueled can do in the United States because of the positive void coefficient. Now, the way uh, ACL was going about uh, reducing that problem is to use slightly enriched uranium. Now, I don't know if you can come up with a design that doesn't require that, but that's the kind of thinking uh, I would like to see. Also, the safeguards requirements for online fueled reactors are considerable. They use up a lot of inspection resources, uh, and certainly we'd want to see developments in how to reduce the uh, uh, 
the safeguards costs of online refueled reactors. So there are there are ways to go, but, but I agree that it's, the promise of the can-do is if you don't need enrichment. Colin? Thank you very much. I'd like to follow up on uh, Don Johnston's question, which didn't get completed, obviously, and uh, express uh, some delight at hearing Elizabeth Dowdeswell's uh, broader canvas on which decisions would be taken. Because my concern, Dr. Lyman, is that you have managed today to line up science on the side of not just caution, but on the side against expansion in, in the use of nuclear energy. And I'm not quite sure how you managed to arrive at this conclusion, and I would encourage you to deploy the scientific knowledge that stands behind you to both sides, the risks and possible benefits of going this direction. And I'd like to query you about, I, I agree that maybe probability theory suggests that there, the fact that there hasn't been an incident still doesn't preclude the possibility of a future one being above zero. But I submit to you, if you look at France, which is highly dependent, as you know, 80%, as Don Johnson said, of their electricity production is nuclear-based, has not had any real safety issues with regard to nuclear. It's a little bit like flying an airplane instead of going in a car. You've got a much better chance of getting there if you're in a nuclear situation than in, a, in the car. So I just don't understand, quite frankly, to be honest with you, why the science on this comes out so in such an unba unbalanced fashion. Well, uh, France did have a partial meltdown at uh, uh, one of its reactors, so they have had incidents. The other thing about France is that they don't have a system of disclosure uh, similar to that in the United States. So the public simply doesn't know about a number of the close calls that have uh, occurred in France. Um, but just to point out, for instance, um, just to address France uh, more specifically, we think that having 80% of your electricity coming from nuclear power is really pushing the boundary of what's actually a um, uh, reasonable part of your mix. And you can see that when uh, you have to start shutting down reactors because surface water, uh, inlet water temperatures become too high. Uh, when you have to shut down your reactors over the weekends because you're trying to load follow, uh, which is not a very uh, um, efficient way of using a reactor that um, should be operated on a, um, on a continuous basis to maximize its efficiency, that we think that uh, if you look at the mix, they've probably gone too far and uh, they're over-reliant now on nuclear energy. And I think if uh, we have more incidents like the heat waves that we saw last summer and two years ago, there could be a serious problem with France. So we, so we don't think they have an optimal mix. I could go on and on about France. Um, one thing, though, is they do have um, their regulators do have a more conservative approach to um, fuel man uh, to fuel issues than the U.S. does. And uh, for instance, um, France has been reluctant to increase the burn-up limits on mixed oxide fuel assemblies in their reactors because of certain uh, test results that it could be a test reactor that show there's a vulnerability to reactivity insertion accidents. And so that conservatism may play a role. Um, uh, and I'd like to see the U.S. pay more attention to fuel issues uh, like that. But um, the the underlying safety concerns are fundamental in nuclear power. And the thing is, a nuclear accident, a severe accident, is a very low probability event. The thing is, we don't know how low probability, and we don't know to what extent we can actually increase uh, the number um, substantially without finding out how low that probability actually is. So in our assessment, there are issues that have to be addressed um, before we would feel comfortable with a large-scale expansion. I, mean, I, I could um, point out many. I noticed um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, reaction on the visage of Monsieur Giscard d'Estaing. I wondered if he wanted to make an intervention at this point. 
Well, I'm not a specialist, and that's why I'm not going to argue on the uh, question you raised, and I didn't intend to raise the issue. I just can tell you that, as was said, 80% of our electric power is generated by nuclear plants for 30 years. And during that 30 years, the safety has been absolutely controlled and expressed, and there is absolutely no major problem. Uh, when you realize that in coal mines, there were about 15,000 people killed last year, nobody cares. If we had one person killed in a French nuclear plant, the whole world would say, now this is a problem. If you look, at, there was two really big shocks. One was Three Mile Island, and finally, there was no, nothing happened. They, they solved the problem by itself, in spite of very big uh, mistakes they made in their control uh, instruments that uh, were... Well, Three Mile um, Chernobyl, as you may know, happened on May 1st, during a time of holiday for all the supervisions. They were in their dachas. So someone noticed something wrong and they could not communicate with the engineers were away, so no measures could be taken. You see, they didn't have the BlackBerry to, to call on help from outside source. So it's something that could not happen with the new modern technology we have in our plants. You know, there is one plant ba uh, built on the Russian model in Lithuania. It cost a lot to destroy it because it was supplying a great amount of the energy of that country, but it's going to be destroyed. We stopped all those models that are dangerous. So we have confidence, and I have confidence in the technicians because they are even in a true environment improving security measures in the future. Thank you. Um, mainly I want to address this to Elizabeth and the panel. It seems to me as though we need to make lifestyle choices. I'm referring to Dr. Lan's talk yesterday, where the Chinese contingent have said continually that they want to have our kind of lifestyle. To me, it seems as though if we choose the nuclear option, it's the easy option. It's available, but at the same time, already on the national TV on Friday or Thursday evening, there are individuals who are going hunger strike because of fear of nuclear and uranium mining in northern Ontario. So I just feel that by pursuing the uh, nuclear venue, we are maybe not fully investigating the technology that we can come up with in Canada to help the third world countries, to help the Chinese population and or ourselves. And I think it's really just a bit of looking at our lifestyle in North America where we use so much energy and by providing ourselves with more nuclear energy we just can't going to carry on the lifestyle that the planet can't sustain anymore on one level certainly uh, I think the point you make about collectively as an international community looking at at our consumption patterns and uh, and our lifestyles is clearly uh, very much a part of the ethical obligation we have as as citizens. I do want to make the point, however, that what we learned from the exercise of the last few years is that um, it re any public policy that actually resonates with a substantial portion of people is one that is that does and is seen to take into account the whole range of objectives. And so for some, environmental integrity is top of the list. For others, it is their community well-being and fairness uh, within this generation and across generations. And I don't think you can necessarily predict where the final tally will end up. But I think it's very important uh, to be able to uh, give some confidence that you have looked at that breadth of objectives, that you actually recognize that, that what you're suggesting is an important objective. It may not win out in the total uh, debate and discussion, 
but the point is that it does have to be considered. Uh, thank you, Andres Rosenthal. Um, I'm going to do something that you might not like. I'm going to pass uh, Dr. Land the mic after I finished because he wants he wants to clarify something that he was quoted as saying, which I don't think is what he said yesterday. But anyway, I um, would start by saying that I think that uh, Mr. Lyman's initial introduction to his presentation, saying that the Union of Concerned Scientists does not uh, come down one way or the other on the issue is, is a somewhat uh, incorrect statement. Uh, I, don't, I didn't see him present anything that balanced all of the doomsaying and naysaying uh, arguments, which I respect, but I think that you can't say that you don't come down on the issue when you present the presentation the way he did. My question is to Dr. Kikuyama. Um, in the cost analysis that you presented, and this is something which occurs rather frequently, I didn't see anything mentioned about an eventual residual environmental cost of either dismantling or uh, disposing or any of the other issues that we've been talking about in terms of the cost of nuclear power, the financial cost. We always talk about comparing it to oil and to hydro and to coal, and, but nobody ever includes, or very few people include, a uh, eventual residual cost that those companies, in the case of companies, or states, in the case of states, may have to pay someday when it comes time to dismantle this or to uh, get rid of the waste. Okay. Um, in terms of the, for example, uh, the waste disposal cost. This is all internalized in a, into the electricity bill. I mean, the, the utility has been putting the money in long in advance before their, their, the waste disposal gets started. So it's been all calculated and put in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in within the, the electricity bill. So it is well accommodated. And in terms of decommissioning cost of the reactor, this is outside of this energy bill thing because uh, the company doesn't know exact cost and so on. So once the, and the, the, the figure comes out, then they start to depreciate the cost. And then that would again it come on top of the electricity generation cost, I mean electricity bill. So that's how the, 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 the system works, at least in Japan. Uh, can I just defend myself briefly? Uh, thanks. Um, on that point, uh, goodness knows there are enough uh, cheerleaders these days for an unbridled expansion of nuclear energy, and that is shifting the balance into a dangerous direction, which we think jeopardizes its future. Because if you don't take the risks seriously enough, you're in danger of experiencing exactly what we heard before, which is another accident or a terrorist attack, which will take the option off the table. If it happens in an industrialized country in a densely populated area, I assure you that it is not going to be a palatable option anymore. And so we think of ourselves actually as, as defenders of the option because we see the way the balance has shifted in the United States, for example. Uh, industry is taking the opportunity of this um, uh, more positive view among policymakers to try to push forward as fast as possible, and they are cutting corners. And we think that that is going to lead to a disaster if it's not managed appropriately. Okay, I just want to clarify a little bit of uh, what I said yesterday. Uh, I'm not really saying that actually Chinese people do really want to to follow the lifestyle here. You know, I, I think that's, that'd be a disaster and also be almost impossible. But I just want to, to say that actually they want to have the choice. They want to have the right to make the choice. Whatever the choice, I think, you know, I think the debate here and the discussion here, I think would help to inform people to make the choice. I think. You know, just relate to the you know quick discussion here. I think nuclear, nuclear technology is also another one of the sort of alternatives that I think you know people actually have to make choice based on many considerations. Uh, but I think, given the presentations, very clear, concise presentation of the panelists, I think somewhat you know I'm feel still somewhat you know confused of what is the facts and what is the you know sort of the uh, so the gas and so on. So I think you know one thing that the project I think is very timely is to maybe 
what do we have, what do we know exactly, what's the fact, and what are the sort of, you know, risks that's based on, you know, guess and other, so, you know, sorts of uh, information, so that at least we can have an informed uh, decision making. Oh, right beside you. Uh, you've been trying for quite a while. You can't give away your place. <clears throat> it's mine now. One there. Uh, you. I um, my I have two questions for uh, Dr. Lyman, um, and under, they're not adversarial. Uh, actually, I, I I think you I I, I like your view. I, I view that this is like uh, Le Paris de Pascal. You know when he said. Uh, uh, is there a God or not? And uh, think of the alternatives. Same thing with nuclear energy. My two questions are, first of all, uh, given your knowledge of, of the area, uh, would you, could you identify, do you know of any, um, or uh, could you point to any good jurisdiction in terms uh, or around the world that are, are doing the regulatory aspect of, uh, on, on uh, nuclear uh, uh, energy uh, the right way or going the right direction? That's my first question. And my second question is, with the issues that you have raised, are they magnified or diminished if we go through uh, to micro generation? Small plants. Oh, because you know, micro is. generation, okay. nuclear plants. OK, so I think the f your first question was, are there any international authorities uh, with uh, any, any country in the world that's doing the right thing? OK. Um, well, I'm not really an expert on, on the inner workings of many regulatory agencies. I do know that my own often says that the international community wants the NRC to be a model uh, and lead the rest of the world, and that makes me shudder because I know uh, some of the things they're up to. Uh, you know, I was encouraged by, as I pointed out, the, uh, the French and German principles, which don't rise to regulatory standards, although they do conform to German standards to some extent for how severe accidents should be managed in, in the EPR. And so, uh, you know, there are glimmers of, of hope from place to place. But um, I'm not sure that, um, again, I just don't know well enough to be able to uh, say with as much uh, detail as in the United States. Um, I would like to see an international authority where um, we do try to un uh, make standards more uniform, and um, that is a very difficult enterprise because no country wants to be told what to do, much less have any, any international agency expressing its authority. But I think ultimately that is going to be an essential part of, uh, of an expansion especially into countries that don't have a well-developed infrastructure now. On the second question, you're asking whether a modular uh, approach or distributed generation of small nuclear reactors alleviates concerns. Is that your, your question? Um, I don't think so. Actually, I think nuclear is especially well-suited for centralized generation. That's because the logistics and resources having to protect uh, a large number of small reactors scattered around the countryside, uh, you lose the, the economics of scale of having large centralized units where you can apply that level of protection. Uh, so I don't think that nuclear energy is appropriate for distributed generation. I know at one time, not too long ago, promoters of the pebble bed reactor were uh, advocating this kind of uh, uh, trying to mimic the uh, a gas turbine, uh, uh, the way that those were distributed at the time. I, I don't think it's it's really the best application for nuclear power. Okay, and then the lady behind. No, she's been waiting for quite a while. All right, I'm going to try to be a lady. I'll be really good about it. Um, I just, I mean, the doom scenario, boy, bring out the razor blade, slash my wrist, uh, makes it kind of doom, but not uh, wanting to uh, play. I, I just think that at least from a perspective of Alberta, we keep looking and thinking that somewhere, somehow, there's going to be a magic bullet, and there isn't. It isn't one or the other. That There's nothing perfect here. 
But uh, on the uh, nuclear expansion, uh, I wonder how much the, the issue that's been mentioned by several of you of water dependent, uh, very water dependent for cooling, and it might be uh, uh, available and possible where you have large bodies of water. But uh, now the expansion of nuclear for even generating uh, uh, energy in the oil sands, which is already very, very water dependent uh, in areas where we are having to put water management. Uh, I wonder how, uh, how do you see that and if uh, that should be a consideration. Anyone want to ch tackle that? Yes. I couldn't clearly hear you, but um, the question was the water dependence by the nuclear and how the public is perceives about it. That, that's, that's the question? Yeah, um, I think uh, you're quite right that uh, perhaps you know, the water demand is going higher as we have more nuclear, but uh, there's one technology thing, is maybe I can just touch up on here, that uh, nuclear also, we can use the nuclear technology for desalination, for example. So if we can <laughs> desalinate the seawater, then we can have more pro in the provision of new, the water. And so that, that's the way out there, sort of like a, another side of the, the, the technology to look at in about the nuclear. <laughs> You may not give you the answer, but uh. I would just make, echo the comment that you make. I think in this country, the debate over the last six months, for example, on the future of nuclear, particularly as it might unfold in Alberta, is very interestingly focused on issues of water and issues of economics, as opposed to the traditional issues of safety and security that have arisen over time. There is a real focus on water. Okay, the very last question. Hello, uh, my name is Bernard Cartin. I'm with the policy. Closer, like that? That's it. Uh, policy Research Initiative. My question is for Madame Dalswell. The process you have engaged on, is it a formal process? Are the recommendations, um, uh, is the government supposed to answer to those recommendations? That's one thing. The next is, it seems to me, a number of issues, uh, te technological issues, technical issues are emerging, and that type of process might be useful to inform uh, policy making. How would you, um, do you consider that that type of process should be used more uh, generally? If so, should it be undertaken by uh, government or, or outside of government? How do you see that evolving? And I know a number of- Okay, that, that'll have to be the question. We're, re we're running out of time. Anyone? The, uh, the answer is that, uh, that our situation was a case of federal legislation but a delegation, in fact a requirement to the waste owners to set up a private sector corporation to undertake this kind of examination. The legislation was very specific in terms of what we had to look at as a minimum and that we had to consult all Canadians and in particular had to consult Aboriginal peoples. We did that, submitted, our, and all of, the, all of the costs of that uh, a three to five year endeavor was paid by the waste owners themselves. It was set up as a private sector corporation, it reported to government, and government has just recently accepted our recommendations in their totality. The legislation, however, was also set up to envision that the corporation would continue with uh, the long-term management. So it's in the process of transforming itself. If by your question you mean in terms of good public policy, uh, is that the kind of process uh, that should be used, uh, one that seeks multiple perspectives, one that tries to listen and learn, one that's based on sound science and technology, uh, one that uses a whole range of instruments that we have at our disposal, absolutely yes. All right, in the background, I can hear the tumbrils bearing lunch to the condemned. Um, if you could uh, vacate your tables uh, so that they can finish setting it up. Um, in closing, I would just observe that uh, nuclear never fa fails to uh, generate uh, heat. And uh, <coughs> I'm pleased to see that this session has lived up to that.